Well, good morning. How's everybody? I hope, you're, I hope you're doing well. If you don't know me, my name's Elliot. I'm the lead pastor here at The Cove, and I want to take a second and welcome you here, whether you're with us in the room right now. What's going on, man? Or whether you're with us on the stream or a little bit later on demand, we're glad that you're here with us as well. I want to ask for your prayers. Uh, as I begin today, you may notice I brought my water bottle with me. I couldn't speak until about Wednesday, completely lost my voice. So if I don't seem as loud as normal, it's because I can't be. All right, so I would appreciate your prayers as we go. And let me pray for you, and we'll get into the Word of God together. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the chance to be in your presence this morning and celebrate what you're doing and what you're about to do and what you've already done. Help us now as we open up your word to open up our hearts to what you have to say. Help me to get out of your way, Father. We ask that your spirit would fill this place. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, as many of you know this, um, Abby and I have been big Dave Ramsey people for a long, long time. Uh, Financial Peace University completely changed our lives and set our family on a totally different track uh, than where we were headed, thank goodness. The, uh, the budgeting tools and the concrete financial goals uh, presented in Financial Peace really appealed to the nerd in me, because if you haven't figured it out, I am the nerd in the relationship. I'm the nerd in most relationships that I'm in, okay? So that's just, that's just what it is, okay? And sometimes, you know, sometimes when we're talking about financial goals, we have, um, we have bad spending habits, but sometimes we can now earn our bad spending habits, right? And so it kind of mitigates them. I'll tell you this, in ministry, that's not usually an option, okay? Yeah, that's not usually how that works. And I don't think I've ever told anybody this, um, but we took, a, we took a pretty good pay cut to move here. From, we moved here from Clearwater and we moved into Julington Creek Plantation. And Eden had just been born, so Abby wasn't working, so it was just me working. And we were living off less than half of the median household income living in Julington Creek Plantation for a couple of years. And so I'll tell you, there was more than one night where the budget meeting was a little bit hairy, okay? Where there were a lot of tears and a lot of prayers and a lot of what in the world have we done with our lives. And I don't tell you any of that to complain, okay? Please understand that. On the contrary, I tell you that so I can tell you this. My God is faithful to supply everything that you need. He's faithful to supply everything that you need. And there is one principle throughout all of that. I mean, pretty much everything got cut out of the budget. We didn't go outside for two years, okay? You understand? But there was one thing that we just refused to cut during this time, and that was the tithe, okay? And I understand some of y'all are already ready to write this message off because you say, well, I read the New Testament. I know there's not a New Testament mandate to tithe. And you'd be right about that. You'd be right about that. And we're going to get to all that, I promise, okay? So don't worry. Just hang with me for a second. I'm not standing up here saying every one of you in here must tithe. You have to do that. That's not the point of the message today. I'm just telling you, this is something that Abby and I committed to when we got married, and it's something that we determined that we were going to stick to throughout our lives, no matter what else was going on. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the terminology, tithing is just giving 10% of whatever you make to God. So the paycheck, the bonus, whatever it is, as it comes in, just 10% of that right off the top, and it goes to God. That's what a tithe is, okay? It means 10%. 20% is not a tithe, 5% is not a tithe, okay? 10%, that's what a tithe is. Anything above and beyond that is an offering. So when we talk about tithes and offerings, that's what that means. An offering is anything that's not a tithe. But amount aside, God is faithful, and we found this to be true in our lives. Every single month, God was faithful. I could tell you story after story, and I know I have especially during the times when Abby was pregnant and we had a whole bunch of extra doctor bills coming in. I tell you story after story about random checks that we never saw coming that would just show up in the mail and all this kind of stuff and opportunities for different side hustles that we didn't know. We just jumped on every one of them. We had all kinds of stuff like that. But God was faithful in the middle of it. And over time, what I discovered is that when it comes to finances, living life with an open palm, is a whole lot better than living life with a closed fist. Have you found that to be true in your life too? 
You know, I think it was the very first sermon. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was the very first sermon I ever preached here. They said, will you preach on giving? And I said, gee, thanks. Um, Yeah, cool. So I don't know how I drew the short straw on that one. But if you were here, you remember, I brought Gerald Thompson up here. And I I gave him a handful of dimes. And I said, what I want you to do is close your fist and make sure I can't get it. And he's a pretty strong guy. I tried. I couldn't get him out. Okay? But what he didn't know was I had a whole bucket full of dimes. And I dumped those dimes over his closed fist. Well, guess how many of those dimes he got? Not one. Not one. He couldn't, I couldn't get the dimes that he had in his fist, but he didn't receive any of those extra dimes either. Now, what I said next, I said, now I want you to open your hand. Well, can I take his dimes now? Well, yeah. I could reach over and grab one. I even had him dump a couple on the floor like that. But then I took that bucket And I dumped the dimes everywhere. They got real mad at me because we had to clean up everything, you know. (laughs) uh, But he ended up, what happened? He ended up with much more than he began with. See, when we live life with a closed fist, we might not lose anything we already got, but we might, and we certainly will, miss out on the blessings that God wants to pour out on our lives. And most of us, myself included, take a long time to learn this if we ever do I already told you I'm the nerd right I'm the guy who has a tendency to live with the closed fist more often than not and we want to keep a a heart a tight grip on our money or some of it might get away we feel like we have to live that way most of us feel like we have to live that way because we're shackled to debt and stuff that we bought that we convinced ourselves that we needed it or we deserved it but the truth is when our stuff owns us instead of us owning our stuff, then we're not free to live the lives of generosity that we were meant to live. And so the things that we think we deserve become sources of stress rather than sources of satisfaction. And that's what we told ourselves when we bought it, right? That's what I told myself. You know, if I can just get this, whatever this is, if I can just get this, then I'll be satisfied. It's amazing the lies we tell ourselves, isn't it? And we believe it every time. Now, don't hear me say that we shouldn't buy nice stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not here to say money is the root of all evil. You might hear that from time to time, but that is a misrepresentation of Scripture. Okay, money, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. What's it say? It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But you know what the antidote to loving money is? It's generosity. It's generosity. And last week, we talked about how generosity has to be a way of life for followers of Jesus because that's who God is, and we're supposed to be like him. And we talked about how generosity goes way out beyond money, and we're going to talk about other aspects as we go along. Today, you guessed it, we're going to talk about money a little bit. But what we said is that generosity is an overflow of love and goodness that comes from a grateful heart and a desire to be like God. And a generous person is generous in all aspects of their life. They're generous with their time, with their talents, with their love, with their energy, with their efforts, and yes, with their money. And I understand that talking about money can be a little uncomfortable, but listen, Jesus and Paul talked about money a lot, so I figured that we aren't exempt from that either. So if it makes us uncomfortable, I guess we'll just be uncomfortable together for a couple of minutes here. But here's what I hope. Here's what I hope. That by the time we're done, we're not uncomfortable talking about money, but we're in awe of our generous God who is faithful to supply everything that we need. You know, in his second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul's writing to them about a gift that they have determined that they're going to send to the believers in Jerusalem. Now, this was a special offering that was going to be used to meet some extreme needs of the Christians living in Jerusalem. It wasn't a surprise. They'd been talking about it for a long time, something they'd already discussed, and now was the time for action. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to begin in verse 1. If you want to follow along in the YouVersion Bible app, you can hit the live event tab and look for Swiss Cove in there as well. But we're going to be camping out in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. This is Paul speaking. 
So there's no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. For I know your eagerness to help. And I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has turned most of them to action. But I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. I love that Paul says, listen, don't embarrass me. I told everybody how awesome you are. Don't make me look bad, okay? So get it together. I'm going to send some guys over here to make sure that, that you did what you said you were going to do. And then he launches into this commentary on giving. And you may have noticed he didn't require them to give a certain amount, did he? That's not what he asked. Now keep in mind, he's talking about an offering here. So the gift that we're talking about in this passage is above and beyond what they would have given to the local church. And while there is no requirement for a Christian on the amount that they should give in the New Testament, you may have noticed also that Paul encourages generous giving. And what are they doing right here? They're giving to support other believers. They're taking care of believers in another city. They're investing in the kingdom of God. The harvest that he's speaking of here is a spiritual one. And Paul promises that God will supply their needs so that they can be generous. Remember how it said it in verse 11? He said, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every way. You might say it this way. You've been blessed to be a blessing. You've been blessed to be a blessing. Now, that's a different take from what a lot of us have. We think we've been blessed because God likes us better than other people or because we worked real hard or because we deserved it. And Paul flips that on its head, doesn't he? He gives them a different why. Why do you think he did that? Well, it's he gave them a different why because the purpose determines the procedure. You see that? The purpose determines the procedure. If I have what I have so that I can make a difference in the lives of other people, if that's the reason I have it, then I'm a lot more likely to do that. If I have what I have to make me happy, I'm a lot less likely to do that. So he says, you've been blessed to be a blessing. And Paul reminds them to thank God for Jesus, and he gives them two reasons to give. He said, I want you to give to supply the needs of the saints and to give glory to God. Supply the needs of the saints and give glory to God. Sacrificial giving brings honor to God. And in this case, they're giving to needy believers who will receive this money and give glory to God for his provision. So in this case, God is doubly honored, is he not? He's honored by the gifts that they're giving and then he's going to be honored by the thanksgiving he'll receive from the ones who receive this gift. So I just want to ask you today, how come you give? 
Why do you give if you do? There are practical reasons to give to the church, okay? Air conditioners got to be fixed when they break. I think we have four or five of them go down this summer, and they got to be fixed. Otherwise, it would be real hot in here real fast. The roof needs to get repaired. This building was leaking a couple different times this year. We had to have somebody come out and fix it. And the roof over the atrium is going to have to be fully replaced in just a few years. It's going to take above and beyond what we're doing right now to do that. There's a mortgage to pay. As it turns out, the staff is really cool, but I don't think if I stopped paying them that they would come anymore. I don't know. We could try it, I guess, but I don't think that's going to go too well. All the equipment, all the paper, all the curriculum, all the lights and the screens and the technology and the live stream, all of it, every bit of it costs money. And without your generosity, it all, it all goes away, if I'm just being honest with you. God has blessed this church abundantly. You know, our budget this year, this year is a big budget. It's like $709,000 for 2023. This year's budget can be met if every adult here gives on average between $90 and $100 a week. We could do that. We blow that budget out of the water, actually. And some of us give a lot more than that. Some of you give more than that. Some of you give a lot less. Some of you don't give anything at all. And I'm not here to guilt trip you. I'm just giving you the raw numbers, okay? I want to make sure you know where we are, okay? And if I'm being just completely transparent with you, where we are right now, we are on track to fall well short of that 709 by the end of this year, which is a big part of the reason why we cut the budget by $47,000 for 2024, which, by the way, I almost forgot to tell you, that was unanimously approved last week. Okay, so the budget for 2024. But 700000 is a big number. And it's a number that we can only reach with God's grace and through your generosity. And as you know, those of you who examine the budget for next year, there's not a whole lot of fluff in there. There's not a whole lot of fluff in there. And that mortgage that we talk about, I feel like I talk about it too much, to be honest with you, but it costs, it's about 25% of everything that comes in has to go right back to the mortgage. Okay, a full week on Sunday, actually a little bit more than a full week of what we're averaging and giving right now, goes just to the mortgage. I'm not talking about utilities. I'm not talking about insurance. I'm not talking about staff. I'm not talking about nothing else. Just to pay for the building. So yeah, you might say there are practical reasons to give to the church. And maybe that's why you give. And praise God. It's a legitimate reason. But if I'm being perfectly honest with you, I hope it's deeper than that for you. I hope it is. Maybe you give because, well, you want to get a blessing. Maybe you read in Malachi that God said you can test God in the tithe and then watch him open the floodgates and see if he doesn't bless you. And as somebody who practices tithing his family, I can tell you that this scripture is true. Okay. However, I will say this. If your motivation for giving is to get something back from God, there's a heart issue here that we need to talk about. Okay, because listen to me, God's not your investment broker. He didn't promise an annual return of a certain percentage. You don't give so you can be given more. You remember what Paul said? He said, you are given more so you can give more. You're blessed to be a blessing. That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. If you give so that God will bless you, you're not being generous, you're being selfish. Yeah? So why should you give? Here's why I hope you give. I hope you give because of God's grace for God's glory. Simple as that. I hope you give because of God's grace for God's glory. Your giving is just one way that you show your gratitude for God's grace that's found in Christ Jesus. And we talked about that gift last week, about how generous our God is, sending Jesus as a sacrifice for you and me that made all the difference in our eternities. His sacrifice on the cross is what gives us the ability to have a relationship with God. And if you have any questions about anything that I just said, man, I'd love to talk with you. Before you leave today, come, come chat with me or find somebody else with a name tag on. That means there's staff or an elder here at the church. We'd love to talk with you through this. If you're not with us in person right now, you can email us at hello at swisscovechristian.com. We want to walk with you through this. And listen, church, I know this is a hard subject to talk about. 
Giving is difficult. It's difficult for me too, okay? Because you know, I could use that money that I give you the church for some other stuff. I really could. It wouldn't take me long to give you the list. There are a lot of things in my house that need to get done, that need to be addressed. There are a lot of things that I've wanted to do for years that I've been putting off. There are goals that I have that I could reach a whole lot faster if I wasn't giving all that money to the church. But I'll tell you how I see it. The church is made up of the people of God, yeah? Church is made up of the people of God. And the people of God make up the kingdom of God. So investing in the church is investing in the kingdom. And that's what I want to do. Because the kingdom of God is the only thing that will last for eternity. And so what did we do? Abby and I joyfully rearrange our budget to make sure we can give 10% of whatever comes in. Whatever God gives us goes right back to the church. It's not, well, if we get to the end and we got 10% left, it's no, we'll cut 10% right off the top and whatever's left, we'll fill in the gaps as we go. See, we give because of God's grace. We give for God's glory. And yeah, it's a sacrifice. And I think that it should be because you remember what David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24 about offering burnt offerings? He said, I won't present burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. He said, I'm not going to do that. Because a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless it costs you something, is it? See, if what I'm offering to God doesn't cost me anything, then I'm giving God leftovers. And I'm not real sure that giving God leftovers brings him a whole lot of honor. Maybe I could talk to, to Cain about that sometime. Sacrifice requires faith and it brings honor to God and I talked about this last week I do want to give one disclaimer here what I am saying is not that you should give so much that you can't pay your mortgage do not hear me say that I said this last week but I want to say it again okay if you're giving so much that you can't take care of your family that's not generous that's foolish okay we talked about Acts 4 said there were no needy people among them that includes the people who are giving too Okay, so hold these two thoughts in your mind at the same time. I should be giving sacrificially, but God's not asking me to neglect the care of my family either, okay? Here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you to invest in the kingdom because it's the only thing that's going to last for eternity. You've been blessed to be a blessing. And if you need help to figure this out, we'll be happy to sit down with you and chat about it. We'll sit down and discuss what this could look like in your life. And maybe you're not sure that Swiss Cove is the place that you want to invest in the kingdom. That's totally fair. We'll sit down and talk about that too. You're not sure. Well, I don't really know exactly how this, where this money is going to go. We'll be happy to sit down and talk with you about how we're using the money that God blesses us with each week. But church, here's what we are going to do. We're going to invest in the kingdom. We're going to celebrate with one another the ways that God provides for us. He's promised to do so. And I'll tell you what, his promises have never failed, have they? I don't think he's going to start right now. Our God is faithful. So here's what we're going to do, church. We're going to be generous in our financial giving, whatever God calls you to give. And while we're giving sacrificially, we're not going to get obsessed with hitting a certain number or a certain percentage on our personal giving. Why not? It would know, be a lot easier if God just said, well, just give me the 10% in the New Testament. Why do you think he didn't do that? I have a theory. My theory is because God's a whole lot less concerned about the amount as he is the attitude. It's not about an amount. It's about an attitude. God loves a cheerful giver. God don't need our money, but he wants our hearts. And he knows the chief competitor for our hearts is almost always money. So we're going to invest in the kingdom. We're going to build it together right here in St. John's and Duval and around the world. Because the kingdom is the only thing that's going to last forever. We're in this together. We say it all the time. We're in this together. What are we in this together for? We're in this together for the glory of God to make disciples of the nations. That's why we're here. May he receive all the glory and praise both now and forevermore. Let's pray together.